types of people here today. There are those who pay for innovation, and there are those who get paid for innovation. Today and in my business, I focus on those who pay for innovation uh, in order to try and get them the best possible deal. My business is Decode. It's an innovation performance consultancy. We work across all sectors. We've had the privilege to work with great innovation teams in organizations like this. And from this, we've worked from saving lives to saving the planet. And across all of this, we've identified the fact that high performance in innovation or any other field of endeavor requires two things. It requires horsepower and it requires control. Now the horsepower thing is something we might deal with on another day, but the key to, to today's conversation really, I want to focus on control. And my business is on a mission to debunk or decode the myths that surround this topic in order to put business people back in control of innovation. And with this control comes clarity. And in a moment of revelation or insight, I ended up asking myself the question, what if we were looking at this innovation thing all wrong? And that's where the secret came out of my topic. So what I realized about innovation, and what I realized that people who paid for innovation needed to know about innovation was that they needed to stop letting innovation off the hook by treating innovation like marketing and to start treating innovation like sales. And if those who pay for innovation do this, I promise you that you'll never lose control of innovation again. So through this presentation I hope to convince you that innovation has way more in common with sales than you ever thought possible. So I've had really only three jobs in my life. I spent more than 10 years as an industrial designer, starting off as an apprentice in, the, in a model making shop when there was such a thing, uh, right the way through to running and then eventually owning my own design agency. For the last 12 or 14 years, I've worked as an innovation consultant, starting at what at the time was described as the fuzzy front end of innovation, a term that grazed even then. But in all of this time, I've also made my living, made a, you know, lived as a salesperson, particularly uh, long cycle B2B consultative selling. So I understand creativity, a little bit about innovation, and I know what it's like to live and die by sales targets. And when you think about sales, one of the things, truisms in the sales world, is a sale is not a sale until the money is in the bank. But anyone who's really honest with themselves about the whole concept of innovation will realize that an innovation is not an innovation until the money is in the bank. And if you accept that, then you have to think very differently about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, so what is innovation? I've started to define innovation as a tool to help organizations deliver future competitive advantage. They may turn that competitive advantage into growth or whatever else they need out of it. But the unfortunate thing that people involved in innovation need to realize that innovation is actually a long way down on people's list when they're thinking about competitiveness and their the future of their organizations. They have a lot of other options that they can consider. They often look to change their leadership. A new CEO gets some new blood into the organization. Uh, they look at data analytics and try and figure out what's happening, what's going to happen next. Maybe get involved a little bit with industrial espionage. They get involved in lobbying and throwing some of their weight around, maybe. Uh, the more uh, reputable ones, one of the, the, the big things they go for is they go down the, the efficiency route. And, and can you blame them? The idea of going in and taking waste out of your, out of your system gives you very tangible and very immediate benefits. Larger ones look to leveraging economies of scale, outsourcing, but the, their favorite of all of these things, their first port of call typically is acquisitions or what they tend to call mergers and acquisitions, but that's a 
just a uh, little bit of smoke and mirrors there. Acquisitions typically means a large organization sees somebody with something they want and they go and they gobble them and they gobble them up. And it's a very uh, valid exit strategy for people who are out there trying to trying to move their company on and move on to the, the next big thing. But acquisition is a is uh, something that, that business people understand in a way that they do not at, at this point in time really understand innovation. And we have to, as innovation professionals, admit to ourselves that innovation is not seen as solid enough to take on some real responsibility in organizations. Um, anybody who's worked in large organizations or worked with people who work in large organizations, you'll find that there's there's almost a glass ceiling in organizations when it comes to the creative innovation people in the organization and getting their hands on the real decision making in organizations. And just like every other glass ceiling in industry, it comes from the same sort of, of mechanism and it delivers the same sort of the same sort of prejudice and the same sort of issues. But innovation cannot be seen as as the victim in all of this. It's business that's losing out. Because if you look at all of the other things businesses can do, the big thing that innovation brings to the table is that if you deliver success by your own people, you, it's not diluted. You don't have to pay over the odds for acquiring capital equipment and, and, and factories and, and, and real estate. Whatever you deliver through innovation, you get free and clear and you can leverage straight away. So it is important that organizations do get to take advantage of innovation in a more in a more strategic manner. It is time that those who pay for innovation started to demand more from innovation, because if you don't start to demand more from innovation, innovation won't come up to the standard you need to be at. It is time to take innovation out of the holiday camp that is the marketing mindset and move it into the boot camp that is the sales mindset. Okay? And for someone who has lived and made a living on sales, right, you live and die by targets. Right? There's, no, there's no question of not making your targets. Right? So isn't the time that innovation evolved and moved on to something a little bit more, with a little bit more teeth? Right? And imagine if that was possible. What would it mean? Well, the first thing it would mean is that business people would automatically know how to control it. The old joke in marketing is that 50% uh, of what you do in marketing works and 50% doesn't. You just don't know which 50% is which. Right? And from anybody involved in innovation, 50% would be a fantastic hit rate. Right? But aspiring to 50% is not going to get innovation people a seat at the top table. So imagine, if you will, a little thought experiment here. What would happen if your salespeople got all of the perks and all of the, the, the remuneration that they normally get, but they had no targets? What would the world be like if that was true? Well, the first thing is, obviously, they'd celebrate the, their wins and they'd take full credit for everything they did, just as they do today. But they'd be a lot more philosophical about their losses. And nobody really expected us to meet those targets. And the other thing they do is they, they endlessly debate about their activities rather than pointing to the results that they've achieved. And what might this look like? In innovation, we do a lot of talking about ideas. And I don't have an enormous amount of trouble with ideas. From a sales perspective, ideas are the equivalent of numbers in your, in your, in your phone book. Right? They are unqualified leads. And until you work them, until you work them through a process, they have no inherent value, they have no real potential until you make something out of them. Yet you don't hear uh, salespeople talk endlessly about the leads unless <coughs> you, you don't anymore. Right? The other thing is that if salespeople didn't work to targets, and if they didn't have targets to point to, and if their achievements weren't taken for granted that the company grew 20% last year, sales probably had a part in that. If they weren't in that situation, they'd be constantly complaining about not being taken seriously. Right? So if salespeople didn't have targets, it's my, it's my argument here that they would sound an awful lot like innovation people. 
right? So my argument here today is that there's a lot more to innovation than business thinks. It's much more predictable. It can be much more structured. And it has to be, by definition, much more strategic. Right? So innovation has rules. Right? Innovation is no more or no less predictable in sales. I've made a living in both areas, and I can tell you that this is absolutely true. And when I talk about rules, my world all revolves around the adoption bell curve, and it's cumulative, the S-curve. The S-curve is a, a life cycle curve, right? And I know the innovation people in the room, I'm probably uh, going over old ground here. But evolution and progress is not a straight line. It's, a, it's an evolutionary process. It comes in multiple generations. Each generation comes with a jump between them. And that jump is what we describe as disruption. And disruption is the thing that really complicates innovation. But disruption, well, it doesn't, um, it doesn't conform to the old rules of more of stacking up more and more of the same thing. It isn't illogical. It just has a logic of its own. A logic can be understood and a logic that can be applied. People like Clay Christian points out the fact that when this jump occurs, the first of a new generation typically underperforms compared to the most advanced, with its complete ego, so the most advanced, the old generation. Um, but the new generation is the one that has the future. Right? Uh, and if you persist with the old logic, you will go the way of the typewriter manufacturers. Does anybody in this room know who makes the world's best typewriters? Does anybody care? It's a piece of information I have refused to actually find out. I keep asking about these things. I do not know because no one is going to pay me a cent to tell them that piece of information. Right? Obsolescence is a fact of life in business, and it was long before anyone ever spoke about innovation. Another sneaky thing that happens in innovation is that the first of a new generation is cleverly disguised like the old generation for a whole bunch of reasons. But you see this over and over. What it does for people in strategy is it lulls them into a false insecurity. Things aren't quite as bad as they seem. It's not really going to be that bad, is it? Right? Music, when it came first in digital form, came disguised as a circular plastic disc with a hole in it. But if you take the full spectrum of music, and if you take the middle bits out, the two ends of this spectrum bear very re little relationship to each other. Same is true when mobile phones came first. They were disguised like you know, portable phones with a little bit extra, with a little bit extra uh, range, right? But that's not what they, they were. Never the communications revolution was never about the phone, right? And that's only clear when you take the middle out and you look at the two ends of the spectrum. Those two instruments have almost nothing in common. And the amount of money that the entire ecosystem makes on voice communications on this side of the chart is almost nil. Almost nothing. There's, there's almost no money left in voice communications. And yet, most of the wealth in the world is generated by a device that we still call a phone, albeit a smartphone, but it is in no way in a, anything related to the others. But while you are looking at it from that perspective, while you're zoomed in from your, looking at it from your day job, it's very easy to miss the fact that there is a paradigm shift going. So, in terms of the predictability of innovation, if you're not aware that these patterns exist, then it's going to be very difficult to know what to do and when from an innovation perspective. But this is just the tip of the iceberg and the number of patterns that are out there that can be identified and built into strategy. And the key point to take out from this is, once you recognize these patterns, right, it's clear what to do and when to do it. The second thing is structure. Right? I'd argue that creativity needs constraint. Right? Why should the need for creativity be in any way linked to an invitation to anarchy? Right? As I said, the first part of my career, I ran uh, industrial design studios. I paid people to design for me. And anyone who has ever made a living managing creativity knows that the key to managing creativity is deadlines, it's constraints. You give designers deadlines, and you give them a very specific brief. 
You don't get a blank sheet of paper and bean bags and tell them, what are we going to do next, guys? Right? Because you'll get nothing. You'll get writer's block. Right? Innovation does not need chaos to be high performance. It does not need chaos no more than any other aspect of business does. Counterintuitively, you need to understand that innovation needs people thinking. Need, the innovation people need a box to think inside of. Right? Innovation people need to be constrained. Right? And the, my final point on creativity and the link between sales and innovation is, is there anything more creative or maybe aggressive than a salesperson who's short of their target on the last couple of days of the month? Right? Out there making offers that people are finding very hard to refuse. Right? And maybe giving away the game on your business as well. Right? Innovation does not have a monopoly on creativity. Right? The third thing, innovation needs to be more strategic. Surely it has to be more strategic than it appears. Right? Well, if strategy is all about results, then why should innovation be any less strategic than sales? If its job is to deliver a share of the required growth that the organization needs to be seen to be successful. So, innovation, I would say, once you know the patterns and once you, you're clear what you're trying to do, is like sales, it's straightforward. And just because it's straightforward doesn't mean it's any less difficult. Right? Innovation is only complicated by the business that it's applied to. Innovation in and of itself adds no value. It only, it's an applied discipline that only adds value when it's applied to a business. Right? And whatever you say about it, just like sales, innovation success is dictated by the whim of external third parties. Right? Nobody forces anybody to buy anything, and yet salespeople still have to meet their targets. They have to get people to volunteer to buy what they're offering. And as to strategy, the road ahead is not always clear. In any aspect of business, innovation, sales, any other aspect, the future is not clear. But strategy still has to go out there and define a level of growth that needs to be achieved. A portion of that growth will come from doing more of the same. And a portion of it will come from new stuff. But the how much and by when equation is the same, I'd argue, for innovation as it is for sales. So I'd like to imagine a life where innovation people committed to the share of a company's growth targets. And they had the skills and the tenacity to, the, to attain them in the same way that salespeople do. And the big trick in sales is managing a portfolio that of uh, spread bets that cumulatively deliver to target. Nobody in sales goes out to meet their target with one big hero contract. Do that and you will fail more often than you succeed. You have a whole portfolio, a whole spectrum in a funnel, funnel that may, you have, may, may have taken you three or four years to build up. And by the time you have a mature funnel, you'll be turning stuff through and you'll know how to prioritize your time to meet your targets over and over. So anybody who's involved in long cycle sales, anyone who's involved in anything other than selling across the counter, has to put the effort in. And sales, while there's an immediate goal to achieve particular sales targets for this quarter and this year, sales takes years to mature. You have to put in the effort in time, no more so than you do in innovation. And sales people have to do it every time. So if innovation people were stepping up to the plate and acting like sales people, they'd do it every time. Right? So if you like the sound of that, if you think that's something that maybe you should be paying for, maybe that's you know a better way of getting value for your money, then Remember that if you buy the similarities here between sales and innovation that I'm arguing for, then you already know how to ask for it. And you already know what to ask and how to ask for it. Because nobody in a serious business takes any nonsense from their salespeople. They don't accept excuses from their salespeople. Right? So I would suggest that you stop treating innovation people as special. Right? Stop treating innovation like marketing. Start treating it like sales. Right? And ask yourself, really, what is the difference between sales and innovation when it really counts? I've already pointed out that from a predictability perspective, that once you see the patterns, 
innovation is no more, no less clear from a predictability perspective than sales. From a creativity perspective, innovation is a total monopoly on creativity. From a strategic perspective, the how much and when by when equation is the same for the two. So innovation can be controlled by business people using business logic. Innovation controlled in this way, I would argue, is high performance innovation. Controlled innovation of this ilk can be relied upon to actually meet targets. And you have to remember who's paying for the innovation. Right? Buyer beware. Right? And remember that you already know how to get what you need out of innovation. So take my advice, demand more from innovation. I guarantee you'll never regret it. Thank you.